With SpaceX and the testing phase of the reusable space shuttle launch system or the Virgin Galactic suborbital passenger flight already accepting bookings for next year. You could be forgiven in believing that we are living through the height of space exploration and technology, but not quite way back in the 70s NASA had detailed designs and plans for a jet that could fly into orbit dock on satellites and fly back home all in a day's work. It was the kind of technology Elon Musk could only dream of and this dream was called the Star Raker, so why would NASA want something like the Star Raker anyway? Welcome to Z and please like and subscribe to dig deep into. NASA already won the space race during the 60s and after landing on the moon and successfully launching numerous satellites with standard rocket-powered shuttles, it should have been clear they had a winning formula, while it was the 1970s oil crisis that caused them to rethink this stance the world had become heavily dependent on oil as its primary energy source, but during that time of international instability the price of crude oil skyrocketed from $3 a barrel to almost $40. Dollars a barrel needless to say the U.S. government were desperate to find an alternative energy source and that's when NASA stepped in with an extraordinary idea they suggested the Radical Satellite Power System. A network of 60 solar power stations in orbit around Earth beaming energy produced from the sun down to power stations in the United States as microwaves. Each geosynchronous satellite was expected to weigh approximately 50,000 metric tons and that is where NASA's plan fell short current space shuttles had a maximum carrying capacity of 25 metric tons and the satellite power system wanted to create two new orbital stations each year, that means they would need 4,000 individual space shuttle launches each and every year. And NASA only had about six at the time, they needed a new kind of spacecraft, they needed the Star Raker. The air breather or rocket-powered horizontal takeoff Tri-Delta flying wing single-stage to orbit transportation system designed by Rockwell International was fortunately given the catchier name, the Star Raker, in 1980. And it was essentially a Boeing 747 for the stars it was essentially what you would expect in the maternity ward nine months after a night of passion between the sleek smooth-surfaced B-2 stealth bomber and his bride a Columbia space shuttle powered by chemical rockets so powerful it allowed her to break free of the gravity of Earth once and for all. This Star Raker child would encompass the best of both while overcoming all their limitations the CIA is well known for its experimentation with mind control using a certain three-letter synthetic hallucinogen in the 1960s and it would be fairly accurate to assume that the creative minds at NASA were dipping into the cookie jar just a little bit in the 70s it becomes clear when you think about how on earth they came up with both the insane idea to form a global web to harness the sun's energy and beam it down to the ground from space but also to design a craft capable to carry out the plan a bizarre craft that would be able to take huge loads into space assemble bulky satellites and catchment arrays then return home in time for dinner there were no shortage of dreams in the 1970s and it appears though no idea was too crazy or far-fetched to explore with oil prices rising at an exponential rate and the human race wrestling with the realization that we would run out of fossil fuels in just a few short lifetimes this proposed spacecraft would have a wingspan of 360 feet 110 meters and a height of 311 feet 95 meters with an expected gross mass of 2,278,800 kilograms that's over 5 million pounds or about 7 normal Boeing 747s combined the Star Raker would be able to load up at a commercial airport. Before flying to a spaceport on the equator here its fuel would be augmented with liquid oxygen and hydrogen more suited to traveling into outer space using proven rocket technology that has worked countless times before. To reach orbit the Star Raker would accelerate to Mach 7.2 at a takeoff speed of 225 knots along a horizontal runway propelled by 10 supersonic ramjet engines once it reached a cruising altitude of 45,000 feet the jet would actually make a rapid 8,000-foot dive this generated enough speed to break the sound barrier. Now traveling at Mach 6 the jet would reach a dizzying altitude of 18 miles 29 kilometers and this is where the 3 million pound force low X LH shuttle some type engine rockets kicked in taking the Star Raker its final leg of the journey into orbit, this design was based on horizontal takeoff and horizontal landing. 
A conventional method of embarking and returning from flight HTHL for short the only difference, instead of flying from the S to France and a Boeing passenger jet the Starraker would be popping out the atmosphere and through the other side the current Space Shuttle Columbia design was vertical takeoff and horizontal landing. A method made famous at Cape Canaveral as millions around the world watched the shuttle and its huge rocket sitting poised on the crawler transporter staring skyward as. They inched towards the launch pad at a snail's pace, this proved risky as the shuttle and astronauts were strapped to what were essentially booster rockets that could blow up at any minute as was the case with the Challenger shuttle in 1986. This two-stage-to-orbit system needed the huge auxiliary thruster to initially break free from Earth's gravity which would be shed along the way the benefits of the HDHL proposed by the Starraker meant less explosive rocket fuel on board as the craft would use its brace of powerful hypersonic ramjet engines to reach that 45,000-foot altitude then maneuver to allow the booster rockets to do the rest. There would be no need for such a sudden violent and sudden release of rocket boost and energy needed to get up off the ground perfectly upright like the VTHL a single stage to orbit approach greatly reduced the risk of catastrophic failure and explosions as the transitions were gentle and within safe working tolerances with the method of getting airborne and into orbit sorted out. What next well after docking at the space station the whole nose of the Starraker would swing to the side to expose its payload allowing easy unloading of cargo it was a simple yet elegant solution to the problem with being able to carry such an immense payload and getting it to where it needed to be safely and in one piece, once it had delivered its valuable cargo of satellite parts needed for the future of the human race, the Starraker would then carry out its arguably most valuable and Unique function it would be able to re-enter Earth's atmosphere resume powered flight and land once again at an airport ready for refueling to do it all over again, it would simply return to Earth in the exact same fashion as a conventional VTHL space shuttle it would initiate entry at a predetermined angle ceramic tiles would absorb the intense heat created by hitting the atmosphere at frighteningly fast speeds and land on an airstrip piece of cake with a fleet of star rakers, each with a predicted payload of 100 tons working around the clock ferrying equipment materials and workers suddenly NASA's satellite power system could be a reality they could actually build these giant floating power stations it is hard to believe that something which sounds like it has been ripped straight from a sci-fi movie was a genuine possibility. Over four decades ago this project is likely what President Carter was alluding to in 1976 when he said, during a public address we must start now to develop the new unconventional sources of energy we will rely on in the next century. A topic close to his heart as he believed the energy crisis was the moral equivalent to war leading physicist. On the project Robert Jihan said the satellite power system is an attractive challenging worthy project which the aerospace community is well prepared to be able to address and that if some persuasive constellation of purpose should assign this particular energy strategy a high priority it could be accomplished unfortunately or perhaps fortunately those persuasive constellation of purposes never materialized with the change in administration. After the 1980 U.S. federal elections and the decline in oil prices during the following decades, many were made to believe the venture to be uneconomic and high risk. In addition, the company that designed the Star Raker Rockwell International, which once upon a time was the largest US defense and NASA contractor, was progressively sold and divided following the peace dividend after the end of the Cold War. NASA isn't as ambitious as it was in previous years, it's focused a lot on Earth and climate. Sciences due to comparatively chronic funding the lofty ideals and plans of the 70s were mainly driven by Soviet competition and without the motivation to show up a now largely cooperative international community. Pie-in-the-sky concepts are no longer feasible or attractive although the Starraker and the satellite power system has been shelved. Some scientists have proposed constructing the satellites from materials collected from the moon which are then launched into our orbit as lower gravity means lower transport costs others go a step further and suggest cutting out the middleman and creating the solar power stations on the moon itself and use smaller satellites to simply relay the generated power. Another left-field idea that NASA has seriously considered is capturing an asteroid into Earth's orbit, the kind that killed the dinosaurs, what could go wrong once in orbit though it can be mined and power stations can be created from the materials extracted. Even back in November 2012 China proposed a long-term space collaboration with India with bringing space solar power to Earth an outcome they specifically mentioned in striving to achieve whatever method we settle on the Tokyo-based Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency has already successfully transmitted energy wireless as microwaves and converted it into electricity now that it has been proven that it can be done.
As we search more and more for an alternative energy source out of necessity, the only questions left remaining are how are we going to do it and who will do it? First many are quick to point out that Elon Musk SpaceX is already utilizing components of Starraker's functionality but it has to be said that looking for efficient solutions to costly problems isn't a patented concept. Starraker was conceptualized to solve the inexplicably high cost of space travel and cargo logistics with an impending energy crisis as its backdrop SpaceX is doing the same thing only from a different perspective. NASA's plan to build this supersonic spaceplane is just one crazy example of the incredible accomplishments we can make and unbelievable lengths we will go. If we think outside the box to solve the problems that come up there may just be a silver lining to worldwide climates or disasters that arise they very well may be the catalyst to a new and exciting technology that will give us a future we never would have believed at the very least if we're getting future retro tech how about a moonraker laser. Thanks for watching and stay tuned to watch the next video.